Welcome to The Fight with Teddy Atlas, presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by Boxing Hall of Famer, the legend Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you feeling? Pretty good. You know, we've been getting a lot of rain here, so I I always talk about everything is mental, you know, 75% of everything. You go in the ring, no matter how you are physically, you know, healthy and up to par, mentally is influences everything it impacts everything it really does in everyday life and when it's been raining for three four days here like it's noah's ark coming which does make me think a little <laughs> bit that noah's ark might be coming because of the way that speaking about living the way that we're living uh out there as not always the best people uh quite frankly when you turn on the tv which i don't turn on anymore i mean oh, i hesitate to see you know, all the violence and against each other and the, just terrible, the the criminality and the, just the level of just uh, civil disobedience. But, but beyond that, just, you know, no respect for people, uh, hurting people, just lawlessness. And so when it rains for three days where you live without stop, A, you start to think, hey... <laughs> Maybe I better, you know, maybe start looking for that arc. Uh, you know, it might be planted somewhere that uh, it, there's a plan to get, I'd see, I don't know if I'd be allowed on the damn thing. That's the problem. I don't know. You know, they, I'm, I'm sure they, they figure out who to put on it. I'm not sure I'd be welcome. But in all seriousness, it does influence your mental when you say that question how do you feel when it's been raining that long it gets you a little you know a little i don't want to say down but um it it affects you your your mood does change you you do get a little melancholy you do get a little you know blase if you will um you know you you if it's not good weather over there you just hop on your jet and you go to malibu boom <laughs> I, you have no idea huh. you have no idea how much i wish i had huh. a jet and could huh. do that because huh. i would <laughs> uh, so so you know it's a good way to start the show with a little levity and a few smiles and laughs but yeah when it's raining for three days ken where it's been here in new york city it, it you do get, you know, people that have arthritis and they have knee injuries and problems, they, they feel the pain. And and from a mental aspect, you feel the pain too. You you get, you know, you get a little bit downtrodden maybe or whatever the word is, but um, it does, it does have its, it does have its impact. So, but then I see your bright face and it wakes me up, it brightens me up and it pulls me out of the rain doldrums. Uh, if I was in them, so all good. Uh, I you I went to I revisited UConn, the University of UConn, talking about getting out of the doldrums and talk about restoring your faith in humanity and humankind. I got asked to go up there last year. I had been asked by the great great coach. The great coaching family, the great basketball family, I mean, they're like, they're like royalty, the, the Hurley family. So I was asked by Danny Hurley last year to go up and speak. We talked about it on this show and to talk to uh, the basketball team last year. They wound up winning the national title. Not surprised. Not because of me, but because of them and Danny Hurley and his coaching staff. Everything contributes. I'm sure you had a, had a small role. So I was welcomed back. I was I was invited back. I went up there. I spoke to the guys. This is what I mean by restoring my faith uh, in humanity and mankind and in society as it is right now. You see all these young athletes, and you could right away say spoiled. You could say privileged. You know, they even though they don't come from privileged places, but they're being given. You know, a great, they have a great gift from God and from their parents and from their hard work, a great athletic gift. But you got to work to develop it. And you have to get opportunity 
Also, these kids have that opportunity to go to a great university with a great coach and great coaches. He has great coaches around him. And be able to have a chance to develop, to have a great, bright future. A future that, you know, not everybody could have. And a special future where you could do a lot of things that some people dream about doing. And you see them and you could say, ah, oh, you're going to see a bunch of kids that don't get it. They, you know, they, they're, they, they're given this opportunity to go to a school, get a free education. Uh, education up in a school like that is probably about 60, 70, probably at least 70,000 a year now. God, it was 50,000 mm-hmm. when my kids were, were going to college uh, in that area. So it's got to be 70, 75, whatever. Great university, great campus, beautiful. And you, you, again, you wouldn't know what to expect with these kids. Do they get it? Well, they get it. And that's what I mean by restore my faith. That you see these kids that obviously are all hungry to, to develop, to learn, to take these steps in their life that are being put out in front of them. But they're good kids. And yeah, they got athletic talent. But they also have human talent. They have character. They have the quiet, the quiet characteristics, the quiet talents that I speak about all the time on this show that you need to be a champion in life. You know, not just the neon ones, you know, the great ones that are genetic that you inherit if you're very fortunate. You know, whether if for an athlete, speed, explosiveness, power for a fighter, right? All those things, great coordination, you know, things that could be developed, but not to that level if, kind of like what I say, punches are born, not made, right, Ken? That you could develop those things, but you have to have a real base of them to develop the, uh, at that level, genetics. You have to have that that gift. and But the quiet talents, the ones I always talk about, like being dependable, being reliable, being a good friend. <laughs> it sounds silly, but being selfless, being resilient, being tough, you know, uh, you know, being caring. To see these young athletes have those. Now, I shouldn't be shocked, and I'm not. That's why I say yes to going up there to speak to them because their coach is looking for those. He's seeking those. As much as he's seeking how good a guy can shoot the ball and dribble the ball and have a vision on the court and pass the ball and have a mentality on the court, a cerebralness, he's also looking for character. He's looking for these things. Kind of like what I look for if I'm going to say yes to a fighter. I don't want to go to camp for two months with a person that don't have character, with a person that I don't want to be around. I'm not doing it. Oh, but Teddy can punch. He hit you on top of the head. He fractured your ankles. Uh, Yeah, beautiful. I ain't buying in. Not unless he has the other characteristics because you're going to need them. You're going to need them along the way. I need them just to stay with the person and be there for two months. But you're going to need them to develop the other things. That's the glue. That's the cement that's going to put those other beautiful cinder blocks of, of... of talent and and hold them in place. Yeah, you got the cinder blocks, the speed, the power, this, that, too. But the cement is what I'm talking about. That's going to keep them from falling off to the side. That's going to hold them in place. And to go up there and see that we still have kids, even kids that could be apt to being spoiled, that are given so much, you know, with these opportunities, to see them get that or be accepting to uh, be availing themselves to get it if they don't completely get it, to be open to getting it, to see that and to see coaches teaching that, not just teaching them a 2-3 defense, zone defense and all that stuff, but to be teaching them those Those things that you would teach your child. Because that's what a coach is. It's a parent. It's a surrogate parent. 
And to see them teaching the same things you teach your kids, those life skills that they're going to need later on. You know, not just arithmetic, not just English, not just history and all those things, but how to treat people. Yeah. You know, how to get along with people. How to, how to care about somebody outside your own sphere, your own domain. So to see people that are still, that are still, you know, doing that, you know, that uh, as part of their job, they see that being part of their job, that they're still doing that, developing finer young men, finer people, that that's part of their job too. And again, to see these young men that are respectful and that besides being as good an athlete as you're ever going to freaking meet, that you could also walk away and say, that's as good a person as I'm ever going to meet. Wow. Wow. So I just wanted to share that with our audience. Um, and, you know, we, we got a... We got a lot. We got a good amount of boxing and some UFC to cover. Uh, your take us into that domain, uh, and uh, you know, hopefully we won't. With more people like that, and more coaches like that, programs like that, attitudes like that, maybe we won't need the arc after all. Go ahead, Ken. <laughs> Agreed. Um, you want to jump in? We'll start with the um, the zone fights. Uh, Richardson Hitchens uh, beats up Jose Zapata, gets a unanimous decision, 120, 108, on two scorecards, 119, 109. Not very competitive. Um, relatively easy work for Hitchens, seemingly. How'd you like that fight? It helped, me, it helped put me to sleep. You want the truth here, right, Ken? <laughs> That's right, it. <laughs> right, Ken. Right, guys. Right, people. <laughs> you right. You you took the words from my mouth. I didn't want to uh, be right. too critical, but yeah, exactly. That was a hard fight to watch. It helped put me to sleep. You know, very. It's good to take natural stuff <laughs> to sleep. Natural, you know, Sam. Take natural stuff. Natural. You ran out of mel. You ran out of melatonin. Yeah, no melatonin. Replay. Very natural. <laughs> Even more natural than melatonin. Um, listen. Cepeda has been in a lot of wars. He was recently stopped by Pro Grace, who's been on our show. Um, Hitchens, he he actually started in the in the Doc Atlas Foundation, and and Chris Mannix was nice enough to mention that. Kind of shocked me to hear Chris Mannix, the one of the commentators, announce it, which was you know he's doing his job. He's looking at history, but. It was nice of him to say that, but he he came as, what, 11, 12 years old, whatever he was, but he started in one of the Dr. Atlas Foundation gyms, boxing gyms that I had funded and developed with my foundation probably 15 years ago already. We don't we don't fund them anymore, but we, we had three of them. We actually created two and the other one had been closed up on Staten Island and uh, because the funding had been pulled from the PAL they won't fund them no more so we we refunded them and like I said we basically built two other gyms one in East Flatbush Brooklyn and two in Staten Island in the projects in 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 tough areas in in needy areas and um they did the job they got kids off the street gave them a Gave them a alternative to some of the things that weren't good alternatives, quite frankly. And along the way, made some champions. Made made some gold glove champions, national champions, Olympic uh, Olympians, not Olympic champions, but Olympians, and I guess a couple, uh, at least interim world champions at the very least. And so, but the one I'm still the proudest of and I'm proud of anybody who came out of those gyms because, again, the foundation spent a million dollars somewhere in that neighborhood to run those gyms for 10 years, 100000 a year for three gyms. And, and just with the help of great people like Mike Cusick, 
who I, I won't insult and call politician. Uh, he was a, <laughs> no, I won't, Ken. He was a councilman here who helped helped me with the funding and to get that gym going. Um, and all the great people around the country that helped with the funding by just being at our fundraisers and giving donations so the foundation can do things to help people medically, people, you know, in social programs and and these kind of programs where whether it's putting a handicap ramp up for the foundation or flying a child out of state with his family to see what a different treatment program that's not provided in his state, you know, or paying for cancer medication that's 1200 a month for a single mom for her child who just had surgery, cancer surgery that cost 200000 but yet... The insurance covered that, but doesn't cover the $1,200 a month, which is crazy, but doesn't cover that for the medication to keep the kid alive uh, after the surgery. We pay for that. Or we pay for chemotherapy if, the, if, that, if a particular drug is not covered by their particular insurance. You know, or, or we'll make sure we keep a single mom out of a, a violent, yeah, violent uh, uh, city shelter that she's got, got to be put in. She's got six kids, and she's been put in there because she fell behind in rent. She didn't mean to, but she fell behind. She's working two jobs. One of the kids got sick, couldn't work a job, fell behind. We don't let her get put into a city shop. So in this case, the money was going to these gyms to get kids, well, to give them a safe haven, to give them an alternative to some of the things that weren't good things out there. And they did their job for 10 years. And the thing I felt the proudest about wasn't necessarily the kids that became very good fighters. Um, and this kid became a very good fighter, Hitchens. But it's not that. And you hope that they're all appreciative. Not appreciative to me, but appreciative to the foundation. Really appreciative to the people that made it possible. The Mike Cusicks, the, 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 the anonymous people that have given that send checks to my foundation so we can do the work, to trust us to do the work, to try to make the world a little better. Try, and we do, and we get things done. And the ones I feel the proudest about, there was a girl that was living in her car. Um, and, you know, years ago when we first started the gyms in Brooklyn with her mother. She's in the United States Navy. Now, how good is that? How good is that? That's a champion any way you slice it. You don't have to ask what weight class. Featherweight? No. Bantamweight? No. Welterweight? No. WBA? No. IBF? No. Uh, uh, WBC? No. What is it? Life. Open weight class. Open weight class, kid. Life. Champion of life. And so this kid comes from there. Good kid. No troubles. Um... But the truth is the truth. Uh, he's got a very specific style. Um, he's Hitchens is the most basic of fighters you're ever going to see. And that's not a bad thing. He's solid with his basics. 90% of the time, he does the same thing. Two different things, Ken. He jabs to set, excuse me, jabs to set up a straight right hand in spots. He, tr he truly uses jab to set the table to eat with the right hand, as I, you know, I often like to say. Uh, his defense, he doesn't get hit. Beautiful. His defense, at least so far, um, his defense, that reminds me of the, that joke when the guy jumped off the top of the Empire State Building and he's dropping down, people are seeing him at the 80th floor, the 70th floor, the 60th floor, the 50th floor. And when he goes by the one of those floors, like around the 50th, he, he yells through the window, how am I doing? Uh, good, good so far. <laughs> <laughs> so far, you're, you're looking good. And so, so far, his defense has been brilliant. Hitchens... His defense is his legs and his ability and judgment to, to set step out of range. Um, he's all about his jab, the straight right hand, controlling distance. You come in six inches, 
he's going back nine, and he's looking to counter. Now listen, he beat an experienced fighter, but also an older and shop one one who's extremely one-dimensional. He beat a southpaw who comes straight forward at the same speed and direction every time. When I give these breakdowns, this honestly and candidly and specifically, I'm using 50 years of experience, but I'm also using something else. Just truth. That I think that people still appreciate the truth. Even if they're a fan of somebody like Canelo. And, and I say, okay, Canelo, you know, we know what he is and how successful he's been, but he's slipping. I, in my mind, maybe call me crazy. I think that there's enough people out there, even if they're fans, to say, hey, you know what, that's honest. That's an honest assessment. And um, that's what you're getting here. That doesn't mean you have to like it or agree. Cepeda, Cepeda did try. I noticed that he did try to be more patient. He understood he was in there with a surgeon. And, and that's, that's a compliment. I mean, this kid looks to be a surgeon. He'll look to pick your part, uh, Hitchens. And Cepeda, he was more patient and tighter with his approach, knowing that he was in there with that kind of counterpuncher. Uh, he didn't rush in. He didn't reach um, or overextend himself to get in. But with Hitchens, with Hitchens, with that style I just described, you need to take away or at least reduce his jab by using your own. And you, you have to look to step with him when he's stepping back because that's what he does. And Cepeda didn't do a good job really with his giving, trying to nullify his jab with his own jab. Um, you know, he, uh, he goes back, Hitchens, and if you time him, you have a chance to catch him going straight out. But you have to, you, you have to know what you're doing, and you have to do it with him. You have to time him. Hitchens has a very cautious demeanor and temperament, and that's, that's how he fights. Very careful, deliberate, doesn't waste anything. Uh, he has, or at least he uses a very, I don't know if it's fair to say he has a limited arsenal, Ken, but he uses a limited arsenal. Uh, his bread and butter, again, like I said, a jab, right hand. His style is a little bit like Shakur Stevenson. But Stevenson is is better right now. You know, he's first of all he's more experienced. Uh, he's he's more complete and developed with a a larger repertoire of punches. But the temperament, the the style of controlling range, of being very cautious, you know, being a good defensive. Him and Shakur are of pretty similar that way. There there are guys out there who really don't do anything fancy. But I call them solid guys. They're calm. They know how to walk you down properly and to throw accurate, well-placed power shots. Mark my words. Those guys will give Hitchens a problem and really test him to see how far that he can go with just with the tools that he has now and the ones that he's just using now. At the end of the day, uh, he's in a quiet taste. Uh, as you know, as as I said before, if and I've said it on this air many times, and it's the right analogy. If you like a baseball game with a pitcher who throws shutouts, doesn't let you know, anyone get on base, uh, you, you're going to like them. Or if you like opera, you like opera, Ken. You go to the opera all the time. You got your own little <laughs> pet penthouse seat up there, whatever. <laughs> what do they call that seat, Ken? The good one in the opera house. What do they call that? Um, you just sit in them. You don't, you don't necessarily know the name of them. But, not the balcony. Oh, the, no. Um, 
Rob, voice of God, where are you when we need you? I forget what it's called. Yeah. Um, well, anyway, if you like... It's not Balcony. Yeah. If you like opera or classic music, right, you're likely to, to really like Hitchens. But if you want to go to a game and see people on bass and a, you know, a full, couple of balls actually fly over the fence, um, you... You know, you're not going to be really getting what you want. Or if you like Metallica, uh, you know, I don't know what your kids like, but if you like Metallica, you know, the heavy metal type stuff, Led Zeppelin, ACDC, you're probably not sitting through a Hitchens fight. Probably not. Uh, unless maybe you get a can of Red Bull, uh, you know. But uh, as I said, very careful, knows what he is. I like that about him. He understands his identity. Uh, he lives on the outside. If you get close to him, what did he do all night, Ken? He grabbed you. He grabbed you. Yep. Because he knows what he is and what he isn't. He's an outside fighter. Uh, so Peter, just as I said, he didn't do any of the things he really needed to to have a fair chance um, to win. I, 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 he basically lost every round. He, he didn't use the jab. He didn't time him going out, and he did not. Here's a main one uh, that really was noticeable for me. He did not work when he got in close. He allowed himself to be tied up, you know. Uh, he cooperated, basically. And Cepeda was, Cepeda was the perfect matchup for Hitchens. Uh, someone, you know, like I said, not fast, predictable, coming straight in. Uh, you know, if you were a matador in a bull ring, um, and that's what Hitchens is. That that uh, that as I say it, you know what? That's a perfect, really, description of Hitchens. He's a matador, um, and if you're a matador, well, the other night Hitchens basically had a horn, or had a had a bull with no horns, um, or or the horns were was shaved off quite a bit. And the bull was slow. Maybe he had a bad, you know, hamstring or something. But it was a bull that was, was, you, he, he didn't come at you real fast. And you could do your matador stuff. Uh, I'll finish with this. I have to because the commentators talked about it. It was there to talk about. Did you see Ken there was actually more aggression in Hitchens' corner when he was yelling at his handlers than he actually <laughs> showed <laughs> that he that he actually showed in his ring. Um, that kind of stuff always pisses me off when people are yelling at each other on the same team. I mean, and you know that the cameras are on you. If nothing else, I don't know get what back in the doing. locker room and have a fist fight. But well, well, the whole thing was crazy. The guy, the guy, one of the corner men, and if I'm the commissioner. He ain't a corner man no more. You, you can't you can't be talking on a phone. <laughs> you can't be. I mean, on the NBA court, you'd see a guy on the cell phone. Okay, the answer would be no. There was a kid's basketball game going on. <laughs> the ref missed the call. And the camera, someone's videotape, a little kid, you know, like AAU, and the camera pans to the ref, and he's talking on the phone. And the fans are screaming at him like, yo, get off the effing phone. If you don't want a ref, then don't be a ref. But it was like, you know, an AAU fairly serious kids game. But the guy was literally like, yeah, yeah, guys, just a minute with the game. Don't, no, don't but they're right. The, the fans are here. right. If you're going to commit to doing that. Of and, uh, course. Same thing. You're, you're, you're in the corner. You're, you know, you're it's part so of his team. You're part of his team. And you're in the corner. you got a responsibility, so, supposedly, anyway. And, and you're on the phone. I mean, uh, okay, he's asking somebody. One, one of the commentators was guessing maybe it was Floyd Mayweather, who he's friendly with. What? He's, he started, yeah, because he started with Mayweather. I think he signed with Mayweather when he first turned uh, pro. Either, either Mayweather's in the corner or he's not. What's he's calling in? What's he doing? Watching the broadcast, hear what's saying, what's said in one corner, calling the other corner, tell him that's well, I mean, it's no, insane. It shouldn't be allowed. A, but you should no, be. No, they were guessing. I'm not saying it was Mayweather. But yeah, they were no, guessing that it was. Then, then he said, afterwards it was his brother or somebody who's like his brother whatever i mean the whole thing was convoluted but if you're 
a fighter, Teddy. You only have two, maybe three fights a year yeah. for Christ's sake. You can't take 45 minutes to leave the phone in the locker room. There should be severe penalties for doing it. Well, I mean, if that's I owned the stock in that boxing. fighter, I'd be selling. Well, look, in any, sell everything. In like, any other just, sport, quite frankly, you couldn't do that. I mean, you like I started to say, not. you couldn't be on the NBA court, one of the assistants there, you know, talking on a freaking phone. I mean, it wouldn't be allowed. Or, or on the sidelines of, of football, you know, of course you got your headsets on, but you're, you're not on a cell phone or an MLB, you know, <laughs> you're not in the dugout. I mean, I know they're chewing tobacco. Unless, and I know unless that, you're Altuve yeah, well, getting phone calls yeah. from center field telling him what bitch to look for. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, look, I know they're spitting tobacco and they're chewing bubble gum, some of them, but they're not talking on a cell phone. Now, look, before some fan out there digs up a hundred years ago, which, you know, it's probably about, actually, it's probably about 20-something years ago, it's over 20, close to 25, 25, I don't know. I once, when Michael Mora, I felt needed to be a little bit of a spark lit under his backside. Michael Mora was great. First Southpaw heavyweight world champ, talented, I mean, just tremendous. And, um... And I was proud to be his trainer. Uh, and, and with uh, John Davimos, his manager, who did a great job, and the people around him, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I was, uh, to this day, I'm appreciative and grateful that they asked me to be involved, to be part of his career. Um, but there was a fight. Uh, there was a fight. Uh, it was, I think we were fighting the number one contender was undefeated. But there were some problems in camp. Usually, if, if there's problems in a fight, it could have led from camp that people don't know about. And anyway, I was, I was trying to ignite him a little bit in the corner. So what did I do? I, I pulled a cell phone out and <laughs> let him think that I was talking to somebody that I thought would motivate him. You know, so, but I wasn't on the phone talking on the cell phone to somebody, <laughs> you know, it was a, I guess you would call it a prop um, to, again, to try to elicit some sparks out of them. Um, we made jokes about it afterwards because the, the, the commission came over to the great Lou Duval, who I had in the corner with me, God bless him, couldn't have a better corner man, came over to him. And said, hey, what is Teddy doing? You can't have a cell phone. See, at least that commission was doing their job. You can't have a cell phone in a car. Uh, you know, and Lou wouldn't let him get near me. Lou wouldn't. He was like my pit bulldog. He wouldn't let him get near me. He goes, <laughs> he goes no, 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 no. He goes, it's, it's all. He was just, well, what was he doing? Lou, Lou, what's he doing? He goes, we got a little hungry. He was ordering a little Chinese food, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Lou, loved, Lou loved food, so they might have bought it. They might have bought it. Um, but anyway, you go down memory lane. I, I, I just, if I'm a commission, if I, if I'm a czar, I, I'm calling for a national commission, sign a petition so we could get conformity across the board with rules and we could get real rules in a sport and get back the credibility that the sport needs and ha needs and deserves for these fighters. Um, with, with, better judging, officiating, across the board with the ridiculous rating, organization, everything to, to get better in all those areas and to clean house. But if I was the guy, and I'm not looking to be the guy, but if I was, and whoever winds up being, we get our wishes, we're going to go to Congress, we get our wishes, we get this national convention, uh, national commission, the national czar, he better be a guy that puts out unilateral rules and enforces them. And part of it should be conduct in a corner. Right, Ken? Conduct in a of corner. Course. Perfect. You want this sport to get back the credibility it deserves? Well, then let people act credible in a corner. And professional. I say the word again. Professional. Professional in the corner. And not be, you know, in the corner uh, on the cell phone talking to someone and giving them, uh, you know, and that kind of stuff. Or, or some of the other ridiculousness that sometimes you see uh, in the corner. Professionalism. Anyway, 
that that covers we covered the Hitchin fight like you know like a blanket and um <laughs> hopefully hopefully the kid hopefully the kid look I want all f- fighters that you know that are working their backside off and taking the risks that fighters take I want them all to make it I want them all to make it and hopefully this kid um you know hopefully he makes it hopefully he gets to that that next place uh but that's my assessment and the next what are we gonna well you're gonna take us to the next one i'm not gonna guess at it but um talking about assessment i just jumped the i jumped the shock a little bit where i say we assess this perfectly we assessed yep. if, if if it's the direction I think you're going, Ken, with a couple big guys across <laughs> the pond. We assessed this, Ken. We assessed this one as good. I was going to ask Rob, and he could still do it, to put up just a little bite from our breakdown because we we're, our percentage, our batting percentage is pretty damn good. Pretty damn good. But But this one, to get it perfect, Go ahead, I'm sorry. I was going to preface this by saying you were right on the screws per usual, but anytime I do that, people will be in the comments about Ken's an ass kisser, uh, well, I, pandering I said it, to so Teddy. Not, anyone, who list, no. anyone who listens to the show knows that you called this one exactly right. Joe Joyce gets beat up badly by Zeli Zhang, uh, the big Chinese heavyweight. I mean, it was hard to watch because yeah, yeah. I think Joe Joyce is a good person from what, I, what I've seen yeah, and heard sure of him. Is. And it was, I, I had a hard time watching it because, I mean, he looked, he didn't look good. He, I, I don't see where he even goes from here based on this performance. He just got pummeled by Zhang. Well, I'm worried who, about him. I'd be worried about him. I'm curious to hear from you if you think that Zhang was just so good that he made Joyce look helpless or if well, Joyce just didn't have it that night or a combination of both. But um, yeah, third round knockout um, set him up with uh, straight left to the body. You called it. Left hook, put him away. Right hook and um, boom, face first, knocked out. Easy work for Zhang seemingly. Yeah, he won rematch. Zhang won the first one as we talked about. Um, he stopped Joyce, I think six round, whatever it was. Well, officially it was due because he closed his eye. Yeah, Joyce took a lot of heat there because technically he said he didn't want, he couldn't go on, you know, or yeah. he couldn't see, yeah. which is the same yeah. as saying, like, I've had enough. Sure. Well, listen, his eye got closed in the first one, but it wasn't because a mosquito flew into it. You know what I mean? It was <laughs> He didn't get stung by a bee. He didn't get stung by a bee. All right? He got stung by an avalanche of punches crashing into you know, into his eye and the rest of his head. Um we 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 did get this one right. Um and again, if you called my bookie with our pick, you might actually be eating, you know, what I'm gonna guess Ken might be eating tonight. A uh, nice Kobe steak. You you just <laughs> you just might. You just might. Uh I had actually said I actually went deeper. I actually had said that Joyce was a shot fighter who'd been hit with too many punches over his career because he was never taught properly. And that saddens me. That saddens me. Because when you got a guy that tough, that much of a granite chin, that willing, and he's not taught right in this sport, um, and there's a lot of guys out there that just, uh, they shouldn't be trainers, quite frankly. I don't know who those guys are, but when you got a tough guy like this, it is really, I actually get angry that a kid like this never got taught any of the basics like defense, but the just the basic rudimental, fundamental things that you, you're responsible to teach a guy if, if you're going to wear that hat as a trainer. You're responsible to teach him that, not just to walk in there and take punches until the other guy's hand gets broke 
or gets so tired hitting you that, that he falls apart and he falls down, crumbles into a heap. No, you're supposed to teach him something, something along the lines of what they call the sweet science. And, um, you know, so when I'm watching it, I'm, I'm, I'm saddened. I'm actually angry that, that I don't know his guys, but that I know some of the guys in the sport shouldn't be in the sport because they don't know how to teach a fighter what a fighter should be taught, quite frankly. And um, it, it made me think of that movie, you know, I, I like to use those analogies when they fit life, uh, some of these movies, and it's an iconic Tremendous movie. Ken, I don't know if it's on your list, but A Bronx Tale. A Bronx Tale. Oh, yeah. And it's that scene where Sonny from the Bronx Tale, the wise guy from the Bronx, where he says to C, the kid that was hanging around him that, you know, idolized him, he says to C, there's nothing worse than wasted talent. And that's what I thought. That's exactly what I thought. Nothing worse than wasted talent. And this kid never got a chance to develop what could have been. I'm, I'm going to step out. People are going to get mad. Guess what? Ask me if I care. Go ahead, ask me. <laughs> no! <laughs> I don't, Sam. I actually don't care. Because I'm going to tell you what. It's not my way. I think you know this. If you've been watching me for 100 years on ESPN, the Olympics, NBC, wherever. And here, and also on Pro Box now I'm doing with with really a couple of great guys, Paulie Malinaggi and and Chris Algieri. It's fun working with them and, and all the people oh, there that re- are there. Really they're, nice guys. They're, they're good guys. So And they know what the hell they're obviously talking about. But I, I know it's, I almost apologize for what I'm going to say. But if I was training Joe Joyce, I'm going to tell you, at the right time, it's, it's, it's too late. He's all used up. But at the right time, he's, he's heavyweight champ of the world. Yeah, I said it. Yeah. Yeah, that's confidence, bravado, you could call it. Not being gracious. You could call it braggart, braggadocious. I never do that. Never. Never. But I'm so, I got so pissed watching this. Wasted talent. And, th- and that's just how I feel. I know that if I had a guy like that, that's that tough, that strong, he could punch, you know, I- I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach him the things he needs to use those qualities to a better level, to, to a more efficient level, a more effective level, where, you know, he doesn't just get beaten down to... To the point where there's nothing left of him, which has been happening through his whole career. You know, it's like I say about a rock. You can't take a sledgehammer every day and bang at a at a rock, a big rock, a boulder, and bang at it every day, and nothing happens. Nothing. It's a rock. Just like people thought his chin was granite, nothing happened. But. You keep banging with the rock. You keep taking that sledgehammer, banging, banging. And then all of a sudden, a year later, you come back and you you know, you kind of rest against the rock. You say, I'm going to take a little rest. You lean against the rock. Whoop. And you fall down because a piece of the rock breaks off. Because even a rock can only take so many hits. And a human chin, a human skull, can only take so many hits. So yeah, I apologize. Please forgive me for my seemingly braggadociousness, my my seemingly being rude and 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 acting and talking like you know a, a braggart. I'm I'm I don't mean it that way, but I do know how to do my job, and I've done it. And I just felt watching that. That's the kind of guy that I want. I don't want a guy that's already developed, which a lot of trainers get. I don't want a guy that's already, you know, uh, you know, does everything 
pretty much right. I want someone that I can have a hand in forming them, that I can help get to that next place, that I can give them something they don't quite have yet, that I can add to what they have, that I can make a difference. I don't want to just be a guy in the corner saying, here, here's some water, champ. No, I, I want to be a guy that, <laughs> you know, that, <laughs> that has a part in making them better. And when I see that, that I would have made them better. I see that that's what I, I crave for a guy like that. Even now, like, give me a guy like that, that that needs to be taught things that I don't know him personally, so I, I'm just guessing that he would have been coachable. I'm just guessing that he would have had some instincts that I could have worked with along with his toughness, the physical things that I see and saw. But that's the kind of guy that I always wanted, besides the fact that he's a heavyweight. Somebody that, a raw piece of clay that you could take in a shop and you could mold them and, and polish them up and then put them out there and say, look at, look at them now. You know, and I, again, I apologize. It sounds, if you know me, you know that I don't do that. Uh, I really don't, but I did it today. Uh, but I did it for a very specific reason. Uh, but getting back to the fight, he, uh, I had said also, after he, after, I forget what fight it was. I don't know if it was after the first fight with Zhang or not. But I said that, hey, this Joyce, they're going to, really, it ain't changing. They're going to have to be careful with this guy and, and really think about when he should retire, which I think is very close, if not there. I just hope that some promoter don't put him in with, with Trezora. Yeah, I said it. <laughs> but all across the pond, you know, for another whatever reason, both of them are old, both of them are taking a lot of punishment, right? They're both beyond the twilights of their career, but they both are popular over across the pond, you know? And yeah, the fight was at Wembley Arena. I just remembered, not Wembley Stadium. So my son told me, you know, he's the only one who tell me because I don't look at that internet stuff. But he told me, he told me that uh, we made the mistake uh, of making it, I was going to make it sound. If I say that, then I'm making an excuse. I'm avoiding what we did, where the mistake was. We made a mistake and said it was Wembley uh, Stadium. No, Wembley Arena. Sorry. But I'm not sorry that we got the most important stuff right. The most important, predicting the fight. What the outcome would be. And that this, this kid, Joyce, who's now 37 years old, and he's three years younger than Zhang. He didn't look three years younger because what do I always say? A fighter doesn't get judged chronologically his age. It's by the amount of punches he takes. Zhang is 40. But he don't look as old as Joyce because he hasn't taken a punishment that Joyce has taken. So I'm concerned that he gets out the door safely. I, I really am, because, again, the rock couldn't take that many hits. A human being cannot take that many hits. And to your point, beautiful point, was it that Zhang was that great, or was it the other? Well, Zhang was good, and he was prepared, but it was a lot of the other. That this guy, he was the rock that all you had to do was touch it and a piece fell off. He, he didn't used to be that guy, but he's been reduced to that guy. He is that guy now. He is that guy now. So whether it was Zhang or someone else hitting him, this was going to happen uh, at this point because of the punishment he's taken over too long a period of time. So I, I, just, I just hope for his, his welfare. I'm not trying to stop someone from making money. 
but I'm trying to stop someone from getting hurt. And I just hope that he gets out the door safely. Um, so my description before the fight, you know, I was saying that if he was around when Muhammad Ali, Ali was around, Ali used to nickname everybody. And I don't remember if he called Foreman the mummy or what, but he would have definitely called Joyce the mummy. because, And that's how I described the fight going in last week. That he had cement feet. You know, you couldn't miss him if you tried. I mean, you turn the lights off, you still hit him. You know, I mean, it's like he's got a magnet attached to his head, drawing the punches. I mean, that's, that, that is how ridiculously easy he is to get hit or to hit. And like I said, I described the mummy, not to make fun of him, but to make the clear vision of how slow and how plodding, how cement-footed, how predictable he really was. And he was. And I also made the point that, and my son reminded me, that I said, Zang ain't no Fred Astaire. But he looked like Fred Astaire compared, you know, to Joyce. I mean, so, I, at the end of the day, uh, as I said, it, it, I just hope he, I hope he can be, I hope he can be healthy as the years go by. Uh, and a lot of that's got to do with what they do with him now. I'll finish with, I always try to give everything that people expect. I'll give a quick, now actual breakdown of the fight. Uh, Joyce came in heavier this time, thinking perhaps it would help him since he had come in so light. In his last fight with Zhang, obviously it didn't help. I thought maybe it might help, to be honest, but it didn't help. Um, moving his head would have helped, but um, also I had to shake my head at the ring announcer, Ken. I, I've said this before, but these guys, they're all so hungry to get a signature phrase, you know, for the ring calls. <laughs> that they really are like you know like to be the I next know. to be the next Michael Buffer um that they're all stealing from each other they're all taking the same damn and and they think that they're changing it a little they're not like we noticed that it's the same damn thing as the guy the week before said or an hour before it's up it's it's getting to be a little annoying anyway as far as the fight first round uh Feeling out round, right? Uh, Joyce actually, I thought, won it. Uh, I thought because he moved to his left away from Zhang's southpaw left hand, um, which was the right thing to do, uh, his power hand, Zhang's power hand. But at the end of the day, it was really a mirage because in the second round, Zhang started letting his hands go, and he, as we said, he couldn't miss. Uh, he, he, you know... He was like uh, our brothers and sisters across the pond drawing dots. He just kept hitting that middle circle. Just kept hitting that middle circle. Uh, every jab, every straight left hand from the southpaw, Zhang, was landing, hurting Joyce. Nothing fancy, just straight jabs and lefts from the southpaw, all of them connecting, all doing damage. One thing that Zhang was doing, though, uh, and it got no credit uh, from the announcers, but I'm going to give him credit for it. And that's why I take the time at the end to break down the actual fight and the actual, you know, analysis of the fight. He did a marvelous job, Zhang, because, yeah, he's a big guy. It was pretty simple. Had a guy in front of him that, you know, that he couldn't miss if he tried to. But... He did a really good job, Zhang, of controlling range. He really showed, I, I hadn't noticed it with him before, an ability to properly control range by stepping slightly out of Joyce's punching range and then right back into his own striking range, you know, to tattoo Joyce with solid shots. Basic, 
very effective for the Chinese for this giant Chinese fighter. Uh, he ended it with a basic. You touched on it, Ken. A beautiful setup combination. That's a traditional combination that I spoke of actually last week on this show. That Tony Zale, the the great middleweight from the 1940 weights, uh, 40s, the great middleweight champion from the 40s, he used it so effectively to knock out opponents, uh, including the you know including one from New York, Rocky Graziano, who they made a movie about. Remember that movie of a young Paul Newman? Somebody up there likes me. That was that was pretty yep. that was pretty cool. They made a movie about Rocky Graziano. Anyway, uh, Zhang switched his left hand to the body of Joyce. Then he came upstairs with a right hook to the chin uh, from the southpaw position to knock Joyce out. Again, very well set up and executed. Uh, I think on this show, we got to start putting up perspective matchups that the fans might like and that we would like for different reasons because of styles or because maybe somebody's been butted up a little too much and made into being the greatest when they haven't shown it yet uh you know hyped a little bit you know it happens right and maybe we want to see one of those guys one of those you know if you will we say it here those golden childs, those uh, those guys that are given the silver spoon, I guess, you know, because they got one of the power brokers, one of the four power broker promoters <laughs> in the world. They they don't have to walk through the glass like these guys do that don't have the power brokers. They they do get the silver spoon treatment. That's that's I'm gonna call them out once in a while. Every once in a while, I'm gonna say, okay, let's take one of them, put them in with one of a fight that I think the fans would like and we would like uh, we would appreciate a couple things one that it could be a good fight interesting fight and two that it would test some of these you know privileged fighters that have a lot of talent but they haven't been made to go in there with anybody yet the way that some of these other fighters are that don't have one of these power brokers as their promoter. So I, I want to start a practice. Uh, Rob maybe can get it together where we'll figure out, like every couple, maybe a couple times a month, we'll do uh, fights that we think the public would like to see or that we would like to see for various reasons. A, great matchup. Or B, test somebody. Take one of these guys from the waiting pool and throw them into the deep end of the pool. Or, or put them in an actual pool. Or take them from the pool that's been very comfortable and heated really nice. Almost like a jacuzzi. And put them in the ocean. Put them in the ocean. And find out, uh, are they as good as we thought they were in the pool? Are they really as good? Well, we're going to find out. So, I'm not making Joyce a killer. Uh, not Joyce. I'm not making um, Zag a killer. But he's 40 years old. He obviously needs to do something right away. And I hope he gets it. He's been around a long time. I hope he gets that chance. I wouldn't mind seeing him with the unbeaten fighter that ESPN and top rank have, Jared Anderson. What do you think of that? What do you think of that, Ken? Oh, hell yeah. You know, Jared yeah, Anderson probably got more fights than him, I think, whatever. But he's a lot younger, right? And uh, as I said, you know, Zhang is 40 years old. He's already got a loss at a draw. Anderson's undefeated. I think it would be a nice test for Anderson, especially since ESPN and Top Rank, they built him up so high. I mean, really high. And the fighter himself says he's the most talented heavyweight out there. Well, this would be a nice way to kind of, you know, put that to the test a little bit, right? And we're not throwing him in there with Wilder who could punch like heck or, you know, or, or, you know, any of those guys. We're putting them in with a guy who has one loss, one draw, right? Uh, yep. Uh, you know, and like I said, it's not like Zhang's a young, undefeated prospect, right? So he's got, he's got some advantages over Zhang. Uh, 
So I wouldn't mind seeing that. Uh, because I'm t- I'll tell you what I don't want to see no more. I'm tired of seeing Top Rank and the other three power brokers. They know who they are, right? Uh, the promoters out there. In this sport, I'm tired of seeing them put their prospects in with basically mannequins from Gimbal's department store. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little tired of that. I really am. How about you people out there, the fans? I'm talking to you directly. Are you tired of it? Because I'm trying to help you guys out here, whether you know it or not. Trying to help you a little bit here. Really. So, if you're not tired, then the heck with it. Then then you deserve what you get. But if you are tired of it, then then really, come on. If they're not going to give you those matchups, we can talk about a great fight from a UFC fight night that was incredibly competitive, unfortunate ending. But man, but was before it a you go the there, round while that's to the point. Yeah, take a page out of UFC. The way they do it, it's it's take take a page uh, uh, out of. Uh, oh, you were talking about what were you making a uh, comparison to? Uh, uh, what what was the fight night? What was that? The fight night, the Fazeev and uh, Gamrot fight. Oh, yeah, that's why I thought you were going. Last but that's night. what I'm saying. Yeah, 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 take, yeah. Take a page, yep. exactly what Ken just led to. Perfect. Take a page out of UFC. Simple formula. Their brand keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Their ratings go higher and higher and higher. Why? Because they put competitive fights on. The critics are going to say, well, Dane is the dictator. He can do whatever he wants. Doesn't matter how you get there. One formula is working and one formula is not working. In boxing, that formula doesn't work. The only people that watch these kind of fights, Joyce and and Zhang, are people like us, the people listening to this show. But if you go to a cross-section of sports fans across the country and globe, no one even knows this fight happened. But everyone will know if they're into combat sports at all that who fought in the UFC every weekend. They put on consistent shows every night. And like I said, I know they have an advantage. They own all the fighters, blah, blah, blah. But the point is, if you don't work towards trying to get to that model, you're just treading water. And if you're not moving forward in life, you're actually moving in reverse. You, the time's ticking by. There's no injury timeout, TV timeout in life. One of my favorite sayings, and I used it when I talked to these kids, uh, great kids and coaches up at UConn last week, is that, and and taking, I'm taking back it off what you just said, Ken, that if you're not moving forward, you're either moving backwards or you think you're treading water. But in my life, I always say in, in my business, the way I look at it, if you're treading water, you're in the first phase of drowning. You just don't know it. Exactly. That's right. That's right. If you're not working towards a solution, you're just t- prolonging the inevitable. You got to be moving, swimming towards something. If we're going to use that analogy, you got to be swimming yep. towards. And even if you don't know what the hell it is, <laughs> you don't see it yet, but visualize what it is and swim towards it. Yep. You're exactly right. Well, let's get into the UFC. Great main event while it lasted. Unfortunately for Rafael Faziz, suffers a a left leg injury through a kick with his right. Looks like, by all accounts, I saw some doctors analyzing the video online saying he probably tore his ACL in his right knee as he threw the kick with the with sorry on his left knee as he threw the right kick kick hit the elbow maybe they thought he broke his foot but when you look back at the video you can see his kneecap appears to like slide forward and and then snap back into place indicating probably a torn acl nevertheless his knee gave out in such a way that he immediately collapsed to the canvas and obviously gamera jumped on him as he's supposed to do the ref stopped the fight but the first round was incredibly entertaining. These guys were going at it. I mean, you knew these two were going to get after it right away. Uh, Both killers. Um, Like I said, it was good while it lasted. Uh, Faziz posted a video from the hospital in Vegas where he was there with Bryce Mitchell and um, I think Michelle Wasserman, uh, all in the hospital in the emergency room uh, on different stretchers waiting to be tended to by the doctors. I was just thinking as he was posting the video, like, what a sport where all the contestants end up in the emergency room uh, on a regular basis. But awesome while it lasted. Good card, top to bottom. I I found it incredibly entertaining. Um, How'd you like that fight? 
it while it lasted. You know, the, what you just gave, the visual that you just gave of them, these warriors, these, these samurai, afterwards being in the hospital all together there, it brought back really memories of the late great Arturo Gatti, God bless him, uh, and Mickey Ward uh, yep. after their unbelievable wars. And there they are. They where do they meet up in the <laughs> in the emergency room? Uh, and they go over and they're they're hugging each other and talking to each other. And they became great friends uh, after that right. first war. You know the funny Mickey thing. Mickey actually was, trained him for a fight. Cornered him out. Cornered him. No, after he that. did. One of the funny things was they they're in the both in the emergency room after their first war, which was one of the greatest of all time in in any era. It's that good. It stacks up Diego Corrales uh, and and oh, yeah. and Castillo, uh, their first fight, uh, and then you got you got Arturo Gatti and Mickey Ward, their first fight. They had a trilogy, but their first one we're talking about. Uh, it stacks up with any of the great fights. It's real in Manila. Uh, just go down a, a litany of of these great fights. It stacks up with any of them from any era. And really, they were that good. But the thing with that one was, there's Gaddy and they don't know they're both in the emergency room. And there they are, they're sitting on the on the stretcher that they were brought in on, right? And they got the curtain around them. And then all of a sudden, uh, I don't know if it was Arturo or, or Mickey, but I think it was Arturo. He hears somebody that sounds familiar he starts to push back the curtain, and there's there's Mickey <laughs> sitting right next to him on on the gurney, <laughs> uh, just like him. And they yeah. they developed a really good friendship. Uh, listen, for Zeev, as you set it up, he's an explosive striker with his hands and legs, and Gamrot is a very solid. This was a match you want to see. Disappointing what happened because it, we didn't get to see it to its fruition. But, again, kudos to the matchmakers over there. They're giving the fans what they want to see. They, they, they are matching the right guys. You got Fazeev, explosive striker with his hands and legs. Uh, Gamrot, solid guy who has an edge on the mat. No surprise what the game plans were here. Fazeev... Wanted to stay on his feet and strike, keep a little distance to make it hard for Gamrod to get to, you know, to shoot to his legs and get him on the mat. While Gamrod, he would look to negate Fazeev's opportunities. I thought he did a great job um, to explode with strikes by using his jab to stabilize him without making mistakes while trying to take Fazeev to the ground. You know, you could get over anxious, you could reach a little, and then you're going to walk into something explosive from a great striker or kicker like Fazeev. Um, so he he was, he was had the right game plan, Gamrot, to try to stabilize Fazeev's abilities on the outside. Um, and then, obviously, he was always looking the right way, without leaving himself, you know, exposed, to get Fazeev to the ground and shoot on his legs. But, and that's that's really how it played out. Exactly the way that you would you would draw it up because of these guys' talents, uh, and it it played out while it lasted that way. First round, very close. Possibly an even round. Uh, neither one had a real edge. Fazeev showed a beautiful counter-punching combination in a spot. And Gamrot used an accurate jab to keep Fazeev from getting anything going. While Gamrot made a couple of attempts to take Fazeev to the ground. But Fazeev defended it really well. His defense for the takedowns was good. Very good. Kind of like Adesanya's is very good. Or... Or um, the new champion um, that we had on our show, uh, Sean O'Malley. O'Malley, uh, same thing. 
That that's not his thing on a match so much, so much. But he could defend, he could handle himself enough. And same thing with Adesanya. You have to be able to defend that, even if you're gonna make your coin striking. So the uh, Fazeev defended it well, and I just thought that Gamrod might have stolen the first round. A very, very otherwise even first round. But the second round, Gamrot was winning early. Uh he finally he finally got the takedown and he secured his position against the fence and had control for a little while, a minute or so in a round until Fazeev hurt his knee with that kick. Gamrot had the lead in the round uh you know, when it was stopped because of that injury. Again, just just a shame to see because it was it was just such an intriguing matchup. I really looked forward to seeing it. Uh, and it was playing out just the way that the matchmakers figured that it would and that the fans would figure that it would. So I don't know what happens. Hopefully he heals up, you know, uh, Fazeev, he's a fun guy to watch. I, I'd love to see him get another chance at it, but Gamrot obviously has earned the right to, you know, to move forward. Yep. Well, Teddy, one thing I want to do is take a minute to give a shout out to our friends over at Athletic Greens. Check them out at, at athleticgreens.com slash atlas for our listeners only. If you use the promo code atlas at checkout, they're going to send you two free, 10 free travel packs with your first purchase athletic greens the all-in-one healthy green drink the only supplement you need every day it's made from whole food sourced ingredients to me which is the key well that's what that's the key to me um anytime you can get all the vitamins and minerals you need from real food you're you're at a huge advantage versus stuff that's made in a lab so check them out athleticgreens.com slash atlas special offer for our listeners only athleticgreens.com slash atlas teddy uh big fight coming up big one coming up and i think there's gonna I, I, i'm I, i'm going out on a limb here and, and calling for a, a major surprise charlo and canelo september 30th next saturday night um for the for our friends at my book you can give me the prediction at the end i want to get your full breakdown but we'll talk about it at the end but right now canelo's at minus 416 Charlo at plus 268, and we got the over-under, uh, plus 209 on the over, 10.5, minus 312 on the under. We'll get into the prediction at the end for our friends over at my bookie. And by the way, our friends at my bookie offering a very special offer. Get this, 110% credit on your first deposit, up to 1000 bucks. So if you deposit $1,000, they are going to match you with $1,100 to bet um, – Minimum minimum deposits fifty bucks, but that's a hell of an offer. Put in a thousand, you got twenty one hundred to play with. Uh, use the promo code Atlas A T L A S. Go to mybookie.ag. We'll have the lines. We'll go over the prediction after we give a breakdown and analysis of the fight. But please check out mybookie.ag if you're gonna bet. If you're not comfortable betting, please don't bet. But if you are, check out my bookie. What are you looking for in this one, Teddy? I'm pumped for this fight. I, I think Charlo's going to pull an upset here. I'm just going to say that right now. Well, I, I talked about it along those lines. So I don't know if I influenced you or you always felt that way. But, you know, f- a few Probably weeks ago. Probably influenced me. Well, a few weeks ago I said that. But look, I Charlo hasn't been active. He's fighting the smaller Charlo, which, you know, because the other Charlo has been inactive, the middleweight champ, Charlo, the bigger one, has been inactive for two years or whatever, somewhere around there. And, you know, we hope he gets back. There was talk about mental health issues. You never, that stuff, you know, you don't want to play games with. Um, So uh, you, you never can be certain what that means, except that obviously he's, he is or was struggling in some dimensions in those areas. We we hope that he's okay, Charlo, the older one. So the younger one is going to get this opportunity to make a lot of coin, to to actually have a legacy, um, a, you know, a, a 
he's, he's got a legacy, but to add to that legacy a special way, um, he gets to fight the golden goose that lays the golden eggs and has laid them for a long time. Charlo uh, uh, gets to fight Canelo. And people are going to say Canelo's the bigger guy, which he is now. But let's not forget, he's not naturally the bigger guy. So I wouldn't put all my coin on that reason that he's just bigger. If that's why you're thinking that he has an edge. Because you got to remember, Canelo's been around a long time. He turned pro when he was 16 in Mexico. So it feels like he's been around 100 years and he's still not real old. He's getting up there, but he's not real old as long as, especially as old as you would think being around as long as he's been around. That's because he turned pro when he was 16. He has been around a long time. And he's got a lot of fights now. But he started at 140 pounds. Yep. And he, he worked his way up. So he's not the naturally. Now, I know he wasn't finished growing when he was 16. All right. He went to welterweight. He went to junior middleweight. Then he went to middleweight. Then he went to super middle. He went to light heavyweight. Came back to super middle. But he stopped growing before he got to super middleweight. He did stop growing. So he's not, I'm being accurate here. I make mistakes. I try not to. And I base it on a lot of years of experience. So he's he's not really naturally the bigger guy. He's the bigger guy now, you know, with all that, with the Mexican beef that he eats and stuff. Um, you know, <laughs> oh, did I say that? Did, I hope I didn't insult anybody. <laughs> It is it is a fact that he was tested positive, right, Ken? I'm not I'm not going out into a limb here, am I? I mean, he was no hundred percent right. I mean, tested positive yeah, for did. banned substance. Yeah, I don't think I'm I don't think I'm really speaking out of class here and um really insulting anybody who hasn't put themselves in a position for this to be said. He did test positive, tested positive and denied it. But I mean, what the hell else are you gonna say? Yeah, you got me. Blamed it on Mexican beef. You know, he wasn't eating the Colby beef. He tested positive for uh, he tested positive for clenbuterol, which is I think a known uh, masking agent that you would take in conjunction with other performance enhancers. I think it does have some anabolic effects as well, but it is a substance that's sometimes fed to livestock. Um, for whatever reason, again, because it has an anabolic effect, maybe it helps the cows beef up, but it is no, it is alleged that you can get it from contaminated meat, but which makes for a convenient excuse. I, I don't know that it's been proven that anyone's ever gotten it from contaminated meat, but that's a, that's a well uh, known excuse for getting uh, exposure to clenbuterol. Wouldn't you have to eat the whole cow? <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I would think you'd have soap? to. Eat, I I would think you'd have to meet, eat quite a bit of it to get it. But I'm yeah, not a yeah, I'm not an all. expert in the area. Either but mind. I know that that's the um, rationale mind. behind it. So he uh, he is not the naturally bigger guy. Now look, he's been at a bigger weight for a longer period and a long period of time and a longer period of time. Yes, is he cemented at that weight? Yeah, I guess he is cemented. You know, maybe for possibly dubious reasons and also not dubious reasons. He's grown. His muscle mass has grown. He's maybe on a weight program where he's chiseled that mass into muscle. And and that's him now. He is now a solid middle, junior middle, or super middle, whatever. Okay. But again, he didn't start off. He grew into this. He... He went through phases to get here. The naturally bigger guy, actually, you could probably say, might be Charlo, who started at this weight, from all I can remember, if I'm accurate, started around junior middleweight, and, um, you know, I'm sure he has no problem fighting a little bit heavier. He probably has to work to make sure that he stays at that weight. But then he was naturally a bigger guy when he started his career than Canelo was. All right. 
And Canelo, as I said, was young. He was still growing. So even when Canelo grew for a while and grew up to junior middle, I would say that Charlo was there naturally ahead of him maybe. So I don't think the even though he may look bigger when they get in the ring because Canelo has now got that thick muscle that he's developed at this weight, right? So, all right, we, we could say that. And the weight is going to be more, well, more advantageous or comfortable for Canelo. What is the weight for this fight? It's, uh, do we have I it? believe it's 68, super middle, Yeah, right? I do 68. too, but I want to be accurate. I'm, I'm checking and, right now. And Let's obviously, see. while you I talk while you're checking, you know, obviously, it's got to be at the way Canelo wants. He's the golden goose. Yeah, all the all the um, all the belts are on the line in super middle. So um, yeah. that's that's the contracted weight. Yeah, and and look, are we shocked that he'd have to move up and that Canelo wouldn't move down? No, because he's the money guy. You want to make the coin. You want to make the the you know the money. And you got to go up to the man. And he's going to the man. Now, here's the breakdown of the fight. I think I I laid it out, the the, the part that has to be laid out, uh, the beginning part, getting into the foyer uh, before you get into the, the main dining room of this, the main section of the house. First, you go through the foyer. All right, we took you through the foyer. Now let's get to the main section of the house to break this down. Canelo is slipping. It has to be part of my handicapping. He is slipping. Uh, I'm not the only one noticing it. My very good friend, and as I've talked about him before on the show, very elite, special lawyer, but he's not identified it by being a lawyer, he's identified by being the kind of person that he is. An elite human being. He happened who happens to be an elite lawyer. He has said to me, and he wanted to make sure that he was on a record, and I said it a few weeks ago on this and I'll say it again. He's saying that it's gonna be a real tough fight for Canelo. He thinks Canelo will pull it out, but he thinks that it'll be real, real, a lot tougher than the line that we just read would suggest. I agree with him. That's right. I think, I, I remember you saying that, and maybe that did influence my decision now that you say That's it. Right. I was, no problem. Um, now, I agree with it, and I I also agree that Canelo's slipping. I've said it before for months, maybe more than months. But in his last fight with the European fighter over there, that yeah, he, you know, I, I just, I think um, he struggled a little bit. Um, he fought a game guy, but a guy that a few years ago, I don't think I'd be making any great statement by saying he probably would have got him out of there. I don't think I'm breaking any great news by saying that. And he didn't get him out. Uh, his last fight, right? He went the distance with um, the kid from from England. L- look up his record. Canelo's last fight. I'm trying to remember. Tough kid. Who? Who? Up. Canelo's. Yeah. Canelo's last fight. Yeah, he sec. went the distance. And you know, a few years ago, he, like I said, I, I would, I would think he gets rid of him. And and the guy's a game guy, but the guy is a guy that's in front of you, that was really. You know, suited for Canelo to have gotten rid of. Put it that way. Uh, so. Oh, was it Lamb? Was it Lamb Smith? No, Ryder. John Ryder. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. And so, and it went the distance, right? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Right. We're being accurate. We're using technology. Yes, it went the distance. All right. Yeah. I. Again, that showed me slippage. I thought I saw slippage before that. But I saw again. The guy's getting old. The guy's the guy's the guy's regressing a little bit. It happens. 
It happens. So put that into the equation, which I am. The fact that Charlo should be hungry, you would hope he's been well taken care of by Heyman. Heyman takes care of his fighters, maybe even spoils them. But that's okay. For me, you can't pay a fighter enough. They get in the ring, they take the risk they take. Um, They deserve whatever they can get. But hopefully he's hungry. He's a good offensive fighter, Charlo. You know, you can catch him too. You can find him too. Uh, you know, he 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 lost to Tony Harrison, but Tony Harrison fought a really good fight. Uh, actually, both times. Uh, the first time when he beat Charlo, and the second time when he got stopped, I believe, in eleventh round by Charlo. I thought he was winning that fight up to that moment. That's exactly right. And then he had a and then Charlo had also had a draw two fights later against Brian Castano that he came back and avenged same way with Harrison. Tenth tenth round knockout in a twelve round fight against Castano to avenge that draw. Charlo has his kinks in his armor, which obviously the Canelo people have seen, and they are bargaining on. But he is a good offensive fighter. He is, you know, he's got plenty left in his gas tank. He's not slipping. He is whatever. I'm not saying he ever reached the level that Canelo reached. But it, he's as good as he's been, ever been. He's got, like I said, he's got gas in his tank. You know, he's, you know, he's he's lively. He's not, he's lively. He's He can punch. Um, he's got decent skills, decent hand speed. Uh, Canelo's, you know, a good counter puncher, very deliberate, places his punches to the body and head well. But Canelo has taken a few paces backwards, as I said or suggested. Well, one one other data point for you, Ted. I don't know if you saw this. I don't think we talked about this, but um, Canelo had a. Um, 23 and one Egyptian boxer called Ahmed El Bali as a sparring partner in his training camp. And the kid said that he thinks Canelo is tired of boxing and not that motivated. And during sparring, he said after a few rounds that he was getting tired. Obviously, the Canelo camp came back at this guy and was like, you're crazy. Why are you talking shit? Like, I mean, it's just an interesting data point. I don't think that sparring partners should get paid to do a job to go out there and slander your guy after he brings you into spar. You get to get trained with the champ. You get the experience to then go out and talk crap about him. I mean, unless he was mistreated in camp, I don't get the motivation there. But it was just an interesting um, comment and something that maybe should be looked at. Is he, is um, he motivated? Is he looking I'm past looking Charlo? At it. It's an interesting. I'm looking at yeah. it because that's part of my evaluation. And yep. that's part of it. I, I, you, how can he be as hungry? Really? I know Michael Jordan, but yeah. he's an, almost an anomaly where, you know, he was in a different sport, but I think it's a fair analogy. He was always hungry because he was he. So, oh, yeah. You know, Colby, <laughs> another one. I mean, oh, that's, but there's not a lot of those people around in any sport or any business they're around, but there's not a mean of them. And that's what makes them so, 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 so special. When you've made as much money as Canelo has, I mean, and he has, you know, it's hard. It's hard to still be hungry. To, to take a quote from the late, great Marvin Hagler, who I miss, one of the greatest middleweights of all times, maybe the greatest southpaw of all time. I mean... What a good person. What a good human being. What a loyal human being. Some of these fighters today that are spoiled like hell. Yeah, I said it. Spoiled like hell. He came up the hard way. He didn't have no silver spoon. He had to do it the hard way. And he did it. Some of you guys take a lesson from this guy. You know, how loyal he was. How appreciative he was. Talk about how he stuck with his uh, yeah. trainers well, when that's they what I mean. uh, were trying to get him to jump ship. Yeah, yeah. the Petronelli brothers. I don't know that everyone's familiar with the story. Well, the Petronelli brothers, you know. they um, There was guys that were telling him, you shouldn't be with these guys, you know. What are you doing with these white guys, you know. You you should, well, what, are they, what are they doing for <laughs> And he said, what are they doing for me? They're doing something you didn't do for me. 
They got me to this yep. place. They've been with me through, <laughs> f- through good and bad. They've been with me, and I'm going to leave them? What kind of person would I be? I'm going to leave them? When they when they stuck with me, I'm sticking with them. They got me this far. I'm, I'm going to ride with them. As soon as someone brings race into the equation of like, why are you with this black guy or with this white guy? You should immediately look at that person as suspect. Like, what does the skin color well, have to do with anything? They're using that for their own gain. Yeah. Yeah, it's bullshit. And it's so stupid. Not for you your look, gain. It's not like a simpleton. Not for your gain. But yeah. he, listen, I believe that Marvin Hagler was one of the greatest of all time. And I tell you, I believe part of it was... Yeah, he was a great puncher. Yeah, he was a great chin. Yeah, he could box. Yeah, he could go get you. Yeah, he was a southpaw. Yeah, he was technically sound. But I believe his character outside the ring that we're talking about right now is loyalty. The ability to have strength in those areas was part of his strength in the ring. Why he was so strong in the ring. Not physically, but mentally. Where he was able to the same way he was able to push away, you know, temptations uh, like we just talked about to to go in a different direction and and just really be convenient to say, ah, I don't got to be with these guys no more. The same way he had the strength to push those kind of uh, offerings away, to push those kind of temptations away, to ignore the devil at the door, and the devil comes to everyone's door. To ignore that, the same strength that it took to do that is the same strength that showed up in that ring with him. To be able to push away the excuse to be tired, the excuse to be hurt, the excuse to slow down, the excuse to give in. Same thing, they're connected. And that strength as a human being, that strength of character, that I was talking about with these young kids from UConn, with Danny Hurley, that strength, that is the strength that does not show up on a Geiger counter of physical abilities, does not show up, does not jump out at you with the neon that the other strengths jump out, you know, and, and does not get credit nearly enough. But believe me, that is the strength that will get you through a bind when your physical strengths won't. When your physical strengths have gotten to their pinnacle, to where they've gotten to the gotten you as far as they can. And on that given day, that given night, they can't get you any further. It's the strength I'm talking about now that will get you further. It's that strength. That's the St. Bernard coming over the freaking hill, uh, coming over the snow bank to bring you help. That's what that strength is. That's what that is. And you people, kids out there, you should understand that. And some of you guys out there with the silver medals and the gold medals, the, the superstar promoter that's handing you everything and giving you everything and giving you that golden, you know, that perfect golden paved road to get to where you're going. And look, you got to get talent. You worked hard to develop it. I understand that. I give you credit for that, but they've made it as easy as they can for you. You should look at a Marvin Hagler. You should look at someone like that, that had these strengths. Because if you want to stay there, because they're going to get you there, but if you want to stay there where they can't protect you forever and you're going to maybe wind up in the ring one day with a guy like Marvin Hagler, if there are any more Marvin Haglers around, and there's not many, and there's not, but if you are, or there's a chance you are, you better have these strengths. You better listen once in a while. You better think about what I'm saying with that, where sometimes you think I'm too harsh. Oh, Teddy, you know, he's he's harsh. He's crazy. He's saying this thing. He don't like me. He's hating on me. I ain't hating on you. <laughs> Dopey. Dopey. I ain't hating on you. I'm, I'm trying to help you. I'm telling you the truth. And the truth's coming. It might be a block away. It might be four miles away. It may be two years away. But it's coming. And you better freaking hear some of the truth to get ready for the truth. But Marvin Hagler had a saying. He had a saying that used to be, you know, it's hard to get up at five in the morning and do road work when you're sleeping in silk sheets. 
And that's, yep. there's so much truth to that. And he was great in so many ways. I'll tell you another story about Hagler. He fought in Philadelphia. They had the best middleweights back then. And he fought all these, these animals uh, in a good way. I'm complimenting them. He fought all these monsters, these middleweights that, that were just in the best. He fought them all. He didn't have to fight them. He could have avoided them. And, and some people say, oh, his promoters were stupid. They put him in with everybody. He got a couple of losses. No, no, no. He insisted. He insisted on fighting these guys. Actually, a promoter back in the day actually said to his promoters, why are you bringing him here to Philly to fight these guys? You don't need to go this route because we're being forced to by him. If they were fighting in Philly and you were mentioning promoters, I'm assuming the legend Russell Peltz was involved in these negotiations. No, no, he wasn't. He wasn't. He wasn't. There was other really good promoters out there too. There was other ones. But yeah, he was he was around, but there were other ones. There were other ones that, you know, were, were also really, you know, really good promoters and good people, some of them. And um but the the bottom line here. The bottom line is that he insisted to his to his handlers, his managers, that they fight because he wanted to find out how good he was. He wanted to know how good he was. He want, and if he wasn't good enough, he wanted to become good enough. And you know what? That's how actually that's how it worked because he lost some of those fights, but then he learned from them, and then he won the rematches, and then he didn't lose. And then he didn't lose. But sometimes you gotta lose to win. Sometimes you gotta you gotta go through that to get to get forged in the fire, to withstand the furnace that's in your future. And he understood that on some level. That's what I'm talking about, his character, his honesty. He understood that. He wanted to be the best. And the only way to be the best in his mind was to be tested by the best. And find out. And if you ain't good enough, go get what you got to get to become good enough. Fight the fight, lose, and then go freaking fix it and come back and beat his backside. And that's what he did. That's what he did. I didn't think I was going to be talking about Marvin Hagel. But you know what? I'm glad I did. Because everybody can learn from that man. Everybody. I don't care what you do for a living. So that's part of the... That is part of the equation here. Is Canelo still hungry? You know, maybe that small partner is telling the truth. Maybe he's not. Maybe he's disgruntled. Maybe he didn't feel he got paid enough. Maybe he got thrown out of camp. Whatever. But is it possible that he's not hungry? Damn right it's possible. Like Marvin said, hard to get up at 5 in the morning and do road work when you're sleeping in silk sheets, baby. So that's all part of it. Another part of it is I've seen the slipping and part of the slipping is he's not as busy as he used to be. Canelo's strength, he doesn't waste much. He places punches, he counters well. Uh, you know, he's, he's pretty accurate and, and deliberate about what he's doing. But he's not doing as much of it as he used to. Again, you get older. He's not using the jab as much as he... He's got a good, solid, hard jab that controls and stabilizes guys on the outside. He's not using it quite as much. He's not putting the punches together. His last few fights, single punches. Before you saw doubles and triples, now you're seeing singles more. That's part of the erosion. Is it because he's not as hungry or because he's getting older? A combination, maybe. Maybe a combination. He's not quite as aggressive. He was never a f recklessly aggressive guy. You shouldn't be. But he'd walk you down. He'd get to you. He's not doing that so much. He's leaving you alone a little bit more now. And if you leave alone a guy with as much talent as Charlo, I'm not saying he's the greatest Charlo. I'm not overdoing it. But he's got enough talent. If you leave a guy like that alone and you allow that guy to grow a little bit and if that guy has some of the qualities that I I would hope that he has as as a champion himself 
if he had some of those qualities and some of those those hungers that we're touching on a little bit, you could be creating a problem for yourself leaving that guy alone. Giving him a chance to to grow during the fight. I think it's going to be an interesting fight. I think that, um, look, could Canelo catch him and knock him out? Yeah, he could. He could. But that that's always possible in, in prize fighting. But I'm going to tell you that I'm going to say it's going to be a competitive, close fight where Canelo might even find himself behind up until the point that he gets himself ahead. I think that it'll wind up going to the scorecards again. Could he catch him? You know, Canelo's a pretty good puncher. He's a, he, he's a, some people say a darn good puncher. Could he catch him? And, you know, he's not an impossible guy to hit. Yeah. He, he, he doesn't get hit with everything, but you can hit him. He'll stop there in the middle. He'll exchange with you a little bit. You can catch him. That's always a possibility. But that aside, I'm going to say it's going to be a tight fight, going to go the distance. It's going to be a a fight where maybe Canelo needs his friends. Yeah, I said it, friends. He's got friends in this business. Yeah, he does. Anybody who's saying he don't, you're naive. Either that or you might be one of the friends. <laughs> and you, you don't want to you, you don't want to you don't want to say it because you're one of the friends. You're one of the guys on his side doing business with him, helping him with one of these organizations, you know, where Canelo is the favorite son, where Canelo is the golden goose, where Canelo is looked out for, where Canelo is protected. Yeah. So if he needs that protection, he'll probably get it and in, a, in a close fight where it'll go his way. Where to go his way. The old times would say, Ken, the old times would say, you have to knock him out to win and then hope you didn't get disqualified for knocking him out. But, I mean, that's <laughs> always a possibility with Canelo. But I think it's going to go the distance. I think it's going to wind up being a split decision. Go ahead, Ken. Go with the whatever you want to. I think I think I might have quoted this in reverse earlier, but basically the over is minus three twelve. So people think it's going over over ten and a half rounds, minus three twelve. Lay hunt, lay three twelve to make a hundred, and for the under you're getting back uh, double money. A uh, hundred bucks gets you two oh nine back on the under ten and a half. And Canelo is a minus four sixteen favorite with Charlo. You're getting back two sixty eight on a hundred dollar bet. So with all that being said. You're going over, you're laying the wood, minus 312 with you. What's that, minus 31,200 to make 10 grand? Not even with your money. <laughs> no. Listen, first I'll start with the sides uh, because sometimes the 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 under over, the, the prop bets are, 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 better, are a better option. They are. But I'll start with the hard part with the side. I'm not laying 416 to take Canelo after everything I just said. I think he'll probably wind up getting it, but the way I feel that this fight could go the other way, I'm I'm not laying it. I would take a little peanut as Crackman, my friend Crackman, Billy Krakenberger, um, the handicapper from Vegas that makes his living in this business. I I would take a a peanut bet on Charlo, uh, you know, to get back a little extra. I might do that. Nothing damaging, nothing crazy. Um, as far as the prop bets with the over unders, uh, I'm not laying three twelve. I want to. That's why I hesitate. I want to lay it. Because I think that it's going to go. I just said I think it's going to be a split decision. So I'd, I'd like to lay it, but I, I don't want to lay that. I, I think I might take a little peanut bet on the under maybe to get, because, you know, there's, there's a chance that Canelo catches him. And there's a chance that maybe Charlo, there's a chance that Canelo 
really gets old. There's a chance of that. There's always a chance of that. So um, I might take a peanut on the under, but I I, I want to be able to say, being that I think it's going the distance in a competitive fight, I want to say, okay, I'm going to put together some money and put it on the over. But I don't know. I just don't want to lay that 312. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, here you go. If you want, if you want Canelo, if that's you think Canelo wins a split decision, you can lay one forty-seven to take Canelo by decision. That's probably more in line with what you're thinking, right? Minus one forty-seven isn't too painful. So minus one forty-seven to take Canelo yeah. by decision. If you think Charlo gets a decision, you're getting back four hundred and forty-four bucks. Yeah, I. You know what? And then there, there's a line by KO too, but yeah. So if you take Charlo. Which is hard. That you you go. You're fighting City Hall. You're fighting City Hall. Yeah, yeah. I I don't see a scenario in which can in which Charlo wins a decision. But if you take him by decision, what are you getting back? Four hundred and forty four dollars on a hundred bucks. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Um, very. But I think I think the more interesting play is if you think look if it goes the distance. Let to your point, Charlo would have to knock him down in every round to get a decision over Canelo. We've seen this many times. It, and then apologize. Canelo. He have to apologize. Exactly. Yeah. So in that case, you take lay one fifty one forty seven on Canelo if you think it's going the distance. That probably makes the most sense. Yeah. I. I don't always make sense, but yeah, that makes sense, and maybe dollars, maybe both. And if you think if you think Charlo has a chance at the decision, you'd probably be better off taking a draw, betting on the draw at plus fourteen twenty five. That's interesting. Bucks, get you back fourteen hundred and twenty five bucks. That's the perfect way to rob Charlo without leaving fingerprints. That that's what they yep. do. That's how they do that's it with exactly latex right. gloves. Latex gloves, a draw. <laughs> That's right. Yep. <laughs> Char Charlo goes and does his thing and does a number on him, and and they know they can't give it to him, but it's really it's really clear that he should win. Make it a draw, so that that's worth a little fun money. Yeah, hundred bucks get you back fourteen hundred and twenty five. Yeah, I would play around with a few of those exotics, you know, a little something there, a little something here, a little dab it to you. Little dab it to you, brother. <laughs> yep. It's interesting because the the over ten and a half is minus three twelve, or you can bet that the fight goes the distance and it's minus three oh three. You get an extra round and a half there for uh relatively free. Yeah. I I mean the minus one forty seven Canelo by decision, I guess that you know. Then you could still, you're not laying that much, so you could still, you know, put a little bit of a bet in there if you feel that strongly that Canelo's walking out of there. But I tell you, recently you I would hedge it with a draw. Yeah, and hedge it with a draw, and maybe even hedge it with a little, you know, a little peanut play on uh, on Charlo on the under. Yeah, on, on the under or just on Charlo, uh, you know, to. To win. What do you get back uh, just Charlo winning? Oh, by decision? Or, uh, just to win, it's plus 268. If yeah. you think uh, Charlo yeah. gets a decision, though, this is how crazy people think it is. Plus 444 as yeah. opposed to plus 268. Hey, you, In other words, you do he ain't little, getting a decision. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but you do a little backup on that maybe just to but, secure but what yourself. You could 50, do is, bucks, 50 bucks just to secure yourself a little bit, you know, in, in that area without throw money all over the but I'll tell you one thing that you gotta think about a little bit, Ken. With the upsets that have been in the air in the combat sports recently, I mean who thought Strickland was gonna beat Adesanya? No one. No one. No one. No one. Well here's the play. If you if you think Canelo by decision, the good hedge might be Charlo by knockout for a small play, you get him back nine forty five if you think Charlo's gonna knock Canelo out. And and really, I mean, we probably all agree that Charlo needs a knockout to get a decision. I don't think he's getting a decision over Canelo, so that might be an interesting bet. Unless he bucks, unless he does nine forty five. Unless he just does a wax job on him. <laughs> and then, you know, it, yeah. possibly he could get a decision, yeah. You know? Could. It's very unlikely, I think. 
I like the Charlo. If you think Charlo has a chance, take him by knockout. Plus 945, that's a big number. Yeah, it is. And then, then you're going along my line that you think the guy yep. has been getting old. And the old timers would say, fighters that are getting old get really old overnight. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, they get in the ring, they're like, you know, let's just use an arbitrary number. They might be 37. And and then right in the ring, they become 77. I mean, they, <laughs> they just bang, you know, they... they <laughs> Uh, they get they get ancient. They get ancient. So, and and it shouldn't be so shocking because they've been around taking punches for such a long period of time. Sooner or later, it has to show. Sooner or yep. later, it shows up. Yep. Well, that's pretty thorough, Teddy. We broke down yeah, a lot was. of fights. Gave thorough. a good. Gave a good. Gave a good preview, and we'll have a. Uh, we should have some good action to talk about next week. And uh, Canelo fight always brings uh, brings the drama. So, yeah, quiet weekend on the UFC front. I think the UFC is off next week. Let me just double check. Um, but yeah, it'll be fun to break down the um, the Canelo fight next week. No, definitely. It's uh, people looking forward to it. Yep. Yeah, I think I think we are off this weekend for the UFC's off this weekend. They are not back until October 7th. So we get a weekend off from the UFC unfortunately. <laughs> I always look forward to those fights and it's always a good excuse when my wife wants to do something on a Saturday night that I tell her, "Oh, I can't do it. I've got to watch these fights. Got to break it down." <laughs> And then she reminds me, we could you can TiVo, you could DVR it and watch it later. I'm like, oh, it's not the same. Then someone on Twitter will ruin it for me. So, night off from uh, UFC on Saturday, but the Canelo fight should make up for that. And uh, you got anything else, Teddy, before we say goodbye? No, I just want to tell everybody out there that please subscribe. Tell your friends to subscribe if you want us to keep doing this. Really, you know, get us... Get that number higher. Uh, I know the whole UConn men's basketball team is subscribing. I know that. <laughs> God bless them. I'm not leaving until you're all subscribing. The other thing I want to say is, guys, if you like uh, if you like listening to Teddy and you want to check out more uh, Teddy Atlas action, please check out his audio book available on audible.com. And as always, check out the Box Raw collection, 30, the 36, uh, Teddy Atlas 36 collection at boxraw.com. Get all your boxing apparel at Box Raw. And if you want to learn how to fight, I'll be... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do the unseemly thing here and uh, terrible thing, but promote myself for a second. Oh, uh, the stuff I do. If you want to learn how to fight, go to dynamicstriking.com and look at some of our yeah, instructional videos. They're pretty, yep. I got to say, they are good. They they are good. They're very good. They will teach you very the things good. you need to learn, uh, both in the sweet science of boxing and even in the MMA striking world. Yep. And as always, thanks to our uh, producer extraordinaire, Rob Moore, and our videographer, Sam. Um, a space. <laughs> Sam Rivera. Uh, appreciate you guys. Thanks to the fans for being with us. Like Teddy said, please subscribe to the show. It helps us a lot with, uh, with the YouTube crowd. And we'll be back next week with all the um, Canelo action.